We've been examining the four great themes of the Advent season. And it's the season of expectation and of excitement as we approach the celebration of the birth of Christ. The birth of Jesus is the incarnation of God. That means when God came down to be able to relate to us and to live among us and ultimately to die for us. And so the themes of Advent as we've been looking at it, first we have hope. And Jesus Christ is the man of hope because there is no other certainty. Remember hope in the Bible is in wishful thinking. Hope in the Bible is absolute certainty. And there is no other certainty than God himself and the promises that God has made. God is also, too, Jesus is the man of peace, the second theme of Advent. He died in order to settle the debt that we had with God. And once he settled the debt, we finally are no longer at war with God. It's like a peace treaty. We're at peace with God. And not only are we at peace with God, but also placed within our hearts through the Holy Spirit is the assuring, confident peace that Jesus has with the Father. He shares it with us. And He gives it to each one of us. A peace that's way beyond our logic and our reasoning. We just can't really seem to understand exactly how we can be so peaceful. Have that sense of peace in the midst of all the chaos and all the turmoil that's going around us. So he's the man of hope and the man of peace, but this morning we'll look at Jesus as the man of joy, the third theme of Advent. Now, joy is never to be confused with happiness. They are not the same thing. They are not even close. Mankind seeks and strives to chase after the elusive prize of happiness. Even in our National Declaration of Independence uh, declares that we as Americans, we all have the right to pursue happiness. Happiness is that satisfaction that we get that comes from the achieving or possessing of something that we desire. You know, I'm, I'm happy when the price of gasoline comes down. I am unhappy when it goes up. I'm happy when I'm invited to sit down for a delicious meal of barbecued ribs. I'm unhappy when I find out that all they have to eat is escargot and pickled pig's feet. <laughs> unhappy. I'm happy when the family and friends all gather around together for the holidays. That makes me happy. I'm unhappy when I find out everybody else has plans. And none of them include me. Unhappy. You see, happiness is based on the events or the circumstances that are around you. Happy or happiness comes from the word happenstance. That's where we get that word. When things happen the way we want them to happen, that's when we're happy. And when things don't happen in the way that we want them to happen or when they, we want them to happen, that's when we're unhappy. But joy is completely different. Because it's not based on something that happens in your life. The foundation of joy is based upon the character of God who makes all things happen. So like peace, joy is a supernatural gift from God. And that gift is found in Jesus Christ because he is the man of joy. If you just look back 
through all the history of mankind. And history just repeats itself over and over. Everybody's wearing different clothes, talks different languages, but we do the same thing. Everybody's fighting, struggling, contending, hurting each other, all trying to grab hold of something that they think will make them happy, even at the expense of other people. Land, power, money, position. Everybody's after what they think will make them happy. That's what history is. But the scripture teaches us that mankind, all of mankind, has fallen short of the glory of God. And there are none who are righteous. There's none who seeks after God. There's none who understands God. No, not one, Romans 3 tells us. So all that striving and all that fighting and all that contending for what they think will make them happy, and by the way, it never does. Or if they think it does, that it does it's only for a little short period of time, it won't last. All of this struggle and all this fighting and all this work is for nothing. Remember Ecclesiastes? Nothing in this world will make you happy. Because it won't last. But there is joy. You know, one day, a couple thousand years ago, a child was born. A son was given. And God was born in human flesh. Remember the account in Luke's Gospel in the second chapter? We have the birth account of Jesus. And in verse 9 of Luke chapter 2, it tells us that an angel of the Lord appeared to the shepherds out in the field. Y'all remember the story, right? Some of you nodding. Okay, you remember the story. Remember what the angel of the Lord said? He said, remember angels are always masculine words. In our, in our minds and in our Christmas cards and our TV programs, we always have these angels with long, flowing hair, right? Beautiful. All right, in the Bible, Bible, angels are always described using male terms. He. Not, never, she. So the angel of the Lord, he said, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of a great joy. Now, some of your translations leave out the definite article A. They should be ashamed of themselves. A great joy which shall be for all the people. Not just one of many joys, but A, the great joy. Behold, I'm telling you about the great joy. Finally, there is joy on this earth. It's for all the people. That noun in that passage is singular. And it's that singular man who has come. The man of joy has come at last. So that there can be joy on this earth. You see, joy happens when we experience a close and personal relationship with Christ. And it's the only way you will ever experience joy. It only comes from a close and personal relationship relationship with Christ. When Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, during the upper room discourse, is to go to John uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, it's a long passage in there, but Jesus is talking to his disciples and telling them about he's getting ready to leave, and he made them some promises, but he tells them that if you abide in me, Abide in me, that means you got to stay close. That's that personal closer. If you stay close to me, if you don't stray off, if you hear what I'm saying, and if you obey, he just finished telling me that if you love me, you will obey. If you abide in me, if you will do that, I will give you joy. I'll give you my joy. How do you get that kind of joy? He just told you. You have to abide in Him. Everything else is happiness and it won't last. If you want joy, it comes from that relationship with Christ. And He said, listen, I'm going to give you my joy. And it's not just a little sip every now and then. 
you know, not just at Christmas time. He said, look, I'm going to give you my joy. Remember, this is, this is the joy of God. I'm going to give you my joy so that your joy, what you have inside of you, be full. You'll never be lacking. It'll be full. It'll be complete. There'll not, not be anything missing. I wish I had a little more of God's joy. No, I'll tell you what. If you're close to Christ, you'll have all the joy of God inside of you. Every bit of it. And he said, and it'll make you joyful. So what is this joy? This joy that comes from God that can't be earned, it can't be claimed, has nothing to do with about possessing things or achieving certain things. What exactly is that joy? That joy that Jesus promised if it's something different than happiness? You see, the joy is the same joy that Christ had. The same joy that He experienced when He came to live and die in our place. Hebrews 12.2 says, it tells us that Jesus stepped down from His exalted place in heaven. He set aside His divine prerogatives. He was still fully God and fully man, but some of the things that God can do, He set aside those prerogatives. And He condescended and humbled Himself. Instead of being the eternal God that He transcends all things, it's as if He poured Himself into uh, the confines of time, physical time and space and inside the body of one person. To live in a frail, physical body. And Hebrews 12, 2 says he endured the shame and the pain and the condemnation of the cross. And why did he do that? Hebrews 12, 2 says, for the joy that was set before him. For the joy. Now we think about the cross. Joy is one of the last words that would come to our mind. But Christ did these things for the joy that was set before him. Because the joy that he received was from the fact that he was doing the divine will of the Father. He was drawing close to the Father in prayer and in obedience and in worship. And that's what gave him joy. It was to do all that God wanted him to do. Everything that the Father wanted him to do. And when he did it, it gave him great joy. Even the cross. And that's the close personal relationship that gives us joy today. When we do the same thing, when we abide in Christ, when we listen to him, when we pray with him, and we obey his commandments, and we worship him. Man of joy promises. I'll give you my joy. You can have it. And I'll fill your hearts and I'll fill your souls with it. You just need to stay close to me. And that's what enables Christians to experience joy. Real joy. God's joy. Even when the things in this world are crashing in around us. That's why James wrote in this second verse of his epistle. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Because when you're close to Christ, it don't matter, the things of this world. When you're close to God, you have real, true, unsurpassing joy. When that first Christmas back in the past, the great joy, Jesus, was sent into the world. Today, the joy of Christ is available to all who love Him, all who trust Him, and all who, as Jesus said, abide in Him. But you know, there's one more joy that's still on the horizon. There's the joy of the past, the joy of today, there's another one. And it's coming. And it's when the man of joy will come again and return. We just heard a little bit of joy to the world. Love that song. Joy to the world. And we sing it at this time of the year. Because we're singing about the birth of Christ. 
Folks, we might be singing, but we ain't listening. Have you read the lyrics? In the first verse, it says, The Lord has come with the earth, receive her king. In his first coming, he was anything but a king. And the innkeeper wouldn't even receive him. And Herod tried to kill him. The second verse, joy to the world because the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Sing songs. When Jesus was here the first time, people slandered him, argued with him, cursed him, denied him. Hardly songs of praise. Verse 3 talks about no more sins and sorrows. Evidently they have no newspapers or televisions. Verse 4 says he rules the world. Really? See, old Isaac Watts wasn't singing about the great gift of joy that came with our first Christmas. He wrote joy to the world because he's talking about his second coming. When he comes again. That's the joy of joy to the world. So in this Advent season, we celebrate all that the Lord brought to us as our Emmanuel, God with us. He was the man of joy at his human birth, as the angel of the Lord proclaimed. He is the man of joy when we are reborn in him and we abide in him. And he will be the glorious man of God when all creation receives him when he returns. You say yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus Christ, our blessed hope, our Prince of Peace, our source of of everlasting joy is the reason we celebrate Christmas and wait and watch the sky. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Father God, we just thank you for all that you continue to do. Lord, during this holiday season, bless our hearts. Bless our hearts, Lord, with a sense of who you are and all that you have done and continue to do in our lives. And Lord, let us not get so wrapped up on the day that's coming, the 25th. <clears throat> let us not be so exhausted and so tired when that day finally ends that we forget to look forward to your coming. Because Lord, you might come even before we get there. Thank you for all that you do and the joy that you have promised.